Chapter 11 William woke before the sun. He had spent the rest of the afternoon the day before and most of the night trying to decide if he should tell Emma what he knew, and if so, then how. He should have put the name together when she first mentioned her husband, but he had served with so many men. Neither Joseph nor Stuart was a highly unusual name, but when Emma mentioned John Holden, the details had come flashing back. After Catherine's death, William had no longer felt he could serve the town of Barefoot Glen any longer. After all, if a deputy couldn't protect his own wife, what good was he? He had turned in his badge, packed up his horse, and headed for some place to clear his head. Where he had landed was Austin, Texas, where Ben Wallace had sold him on the benefits of being a Texas Ranger. With nothing tying him down, William had agreed, and enjoyed riding with the other men until the day he was approached by Jack Hardesty. Are you Wild Bill Cook? William looked up at the visitor. He had been given the nickname a few months into becoming a ranger, as his fearless attitude became known. But he didn't recognize this man with his tan skin, dark hair, and handlebar mustache. I am. What can I do for you? Actually, the man said with a small smile, it's more about what I can do for you. I don't understand, William said, shaking his head. Your reputation has preceded you, and I think you would make a great bounty hunter. I'm here to offer you a job. I already have a job, William said, dropping his gaze back to the desk. Yes, but I doubt it can pay like this. The man slid a paper across the desk and into William's gaze. William had no real need for more money, as he had no family to support, and the ranger pay was more than enough to cover his needs but there was something about seeing all those zeros that grabbed his attention. His eyes widened as he read the information. Four thousand dollars? The man nodded. And that's just your cut, because this job is so big, a few of us are being called in. Normally, you'd work alone and earn at least double that. What do you need me to do? William asked, meeting the man's eyes again. You'll need to round up some good rangers. We're wanting at least 20 men on this takedown. John Holden is not one to underestimate. And that was how Joseph Stewart had become involved. William had rounded up a few men from Austin and then sent out telegrams to surrounding areas. Joseph Stewart had been one of many who had thrown their hats in the ring. The men knew going after outlaws was dangerous, but even William had never suspected how dangerous this one was. He wondered now why Stuart had joined. If the man had recently married, why had he been willing to take on a job that might be dangerous? Had he needed the money? Being a ranger didn't pay as well as bounty hunting, but it would have been a nice sum anyway. Perhaps it had been for the money, or perhaps just the sense of duty. William tightened his grip on the reins with one hand, while the other sat on the hilt of his revolver. A glance around revealed the other men in a similar position. They had been tracking the infamous John Holden for days, and finally their undercover operative had told them Holden was on a train headed for Dallas. The train, now sat in front of them, stopped on the tracks by the deputies on board. Jack Hardesty, the leader of this roundup, had managed to get a few deputies on the train at the last station. Now the group outside was simply waiting for the sign that Holden had been apprehended. A shot rang out in the air, and the men sprang into action. Several men dismounted and headed for the main door of the train with their guns drawn. A door towards the back of the train slid open, and a man jumped out. It's Horace Gilbert, one of the men shouted out. Don't let him get away. Gilbert was Holden's right-hand man and almost as bad as Holden. William turned his horse in that direction and motioned his rangers to follow him. Gilbert had gotten a head start on them, but they were faster on horses and quickly saw him ducking through the tall sage grass. Holding his arm as steady as he could, William fired off a shot. It missed, but must have been close as Gilbert quickly shifted direction. 
A few more shots went off around William as the other men aimed and fired. None of them hit the mark either, despite being good marksmen, but it was much harder to hit a running, zigzagging target. Taking a deep breath, William focused his eyes on the suspect and fired another shot. This time, Gilbert went down. By the time William reached the area, another ranger was hauling him to his feet. His shot had hit Gilbert's shoulder, but it appeared to be just a flesh wound. Nice work, Cook, one of his rangers said as he secured Gilbert's hands behind his back. William nodded and tapped his hat, all in a day's work. He had always been a decent shot, but had rarely used it until Catherine's death, when a drunken brawl poured out into the streets. The bullet had hit her as she exited the mercantile, and William had watched as she fell, and the contents of her bag spilled into the street. He turned his horse around and headed back to the train to make sure Holden had also been apprehended. William was almost to the train when he heard the gunfire behind him. Turning quickly, he saw Gilbert had managed to get a hand free and had grabbed the gun of one of the nearby rangers. A bullet took Gilbert down, but not before William saw two of his men fall. William raced back to the scene. Three of his men lay on the ground along with Gilbert, who had been shot in the chest. Sorry, boss, Henry, one of the rangers he worked closely with in Austin, said. He managed to grab Joseph's gun and had him, Harry, and Arthur shot before we knew what happened. William cursed his stupidity as he dismounted. He should have stayed to make sure Gilbert was secure before checking in on Holden. Harry Gibbons moaned on the ground. He'd taken a shot to the arm, but would probably be okay. Arthur Jones and Joseph Stewart lay still. As they were both men from other cities who had answered his call for help, William knew nothing about them. Load them all up, William ordered. We can at least send their bodies home. He turned away before the emotion displayed on his face. This was his fault. The door to the room banged open, shattering his walk down memory lane. Jenny raced into the room. You're not up yet, she asked. You have to get up. It's church day. Oh, I don't usually go to church, William said. Why not? The little girl asked, her face scrunching in confusion. Well, because God took something I loved, he replied. Jenny stared at him. So you haven't felt like worshiping him since? That's right, I haven't, he said. I know how that feels, she said, dropping her eyes and twisting her foot into the floor. Pastor Lewis always says that we might not choose or understand the things God allows, but we should trust his plan and continue to follow him. William stared at the doll-faced girl. Her blue eyes were innocent and childlike, so in contrast to the profound words that had just escaped her mouth. How did you get so knowledgeable? He asked. I had to talk with Pastor Lewis a lot when I realized Mommy died giving me life. That's a lot for a six-year-old to carry, you know? William bit his lip to keep from smiling at the girl. Her words were heartbreaking and not funny, but the seriousness in which she said them created a funny image in his head. Yes, I can see how that would be a lot to carry, he said. Who did God take from you? She asked. He paused. Did he really want to reopen this wound? However, she had been brave enough to share about her mother, and she was only six, so he couldn't see the harm. My wife. God took my wife from me. Come to church with me. You can sit beside me, and I'll ask God to give you the comfort he's given me. Though William still had no desire to step into a church, he couldn't say no to the endearing face before him. Okay, skedaddle out of here for a minute so I can get cleaned up and I'll meet you outside. A wide smile broke out on Jenny's face. I'll tell Emma, she cried. She'll be so pleased. Before he could ask what she meant by that, Jenny had spun and raced out of the room as quickly as she entered. 
Still a little stiff, William walked slowly to his saddlebag and reached inside for a new change of clothes. The ones he was currently wearing were beginning to become ripe. He would have loved a bath as well, but there was no time for that. With new clothes on, he headed into the kitchen.